it's time to uh, talk about hot dogs, orchestra, and vinyl. And joining us to explain a little bit about that is Sean Watterson, who is the co-owner of Happy Dog in the Gordon Square Arts District. Good morning, Sean. Thanks for joining us today. Good morning. Thanks for having me on. So let me get this straight. You have a place, Happy Dog Saloon, is that what it's called? Or a tavern? Uh, we or just call it a... Happy Dog. People call it a saloon, a tavern. Um, they, want to put in, they want to put a definition on it, don't they? <laughs> they do. They do. And, it, and it's funny because it kind of uh, defies uh, definition a little bit. I mean, it's a bar and a restaurant, and uh, we do a lot of live music. Um, but we do a lot of other stuff too. We we do science lectures with Case Western, um, local author series. We just try and keep uh, a lot of interesting things going on there. But your main food is hot dog, right? Or right, uh, yeah. Our menu is pretty limited. All we do are hot dogs, French fries, and tater tots. But um, but we do fifty different things you can get on top of them, and it's all stuff we make in house. Our our chef is Eric Williams who owns a restaurant called Momocho. And he's a great guy. He's been on diners, drive-ins, and dives, nominated for all sorts of big foodie awards. So it's kind of fun. It's highbrow, lowbrow kind of combination. Right. I saw a picture. There was one hot dog that has been stuck in my mind since I saw the little video that explaining about this orchestra that comes in the recording you're doing. It's a hot dog that has like a... A deer dill spear pickle right alongside the hot dog. It's like they've teamed up in the bun, and I'm thinking that's that's one to have. I think yeah, that's a good one. Uh, you know, but you can get just about anything on there. Mine's got the uh, peanut butter, chocolate mole, onion and bacon. It sounds weird, but uh, some of these weird combinations really really uh, end up working out. Wow, you just have to have a bun that's good enough, strong enough, and enough confidence to hold all that. I think. Cause, yeah, well, that and a fork and a knife. <laughs> and plenty of napkins, too. And something mm-hmm. to wash it down with. But you, as you mentioned, how you have all the different, like, lectures and you have orchestras, then I guess that feeds into what is really going on there at the Gordon Square Arts District, isn't it? I mean, that's kind of the idea behind all the, the shops and the places in that area. Yeah, it's, it, what's, what's great about it is um, it is a real arts-driven neighborhood, and that's been great for the businesses and the res, residents in the district. So, you know, we've got music along with uh, the Parkview, uh, Stone Mad Tavern, um, the Harp just down the street from us. you got a lot of bars that have some great music, but then you've got the Cleveland Public Theater. Um, we just had a groundbreaking ceremony this week for another theater that's going to be built, uh, the Near West Theater, uh, which is more of a community theater. And then you've got great visual arts. You've got the whole 78th Street Studios um, slew of galleries. I think they're I think they're up to over 40 art galleries contained in the old uh, the old building that was an American Greetings facility years ago. Well, it's amazing how they take in community development. Always looks towards sometimes towards the arts, and it creates an interesting culture and the, and the prosperity in that area is always what they're looking for. And it also allows people to do things what you're going to be doing coming up uh, that make them maybe people don't kind of tilt their head and go, hmm? you know, you're going to be ha- the Cleveland Orchestra. You always have them come in, and I guess it's on a weekly or uh, every so often they come in and perform uh, the chamber orchestra, right? Or Right. Uh, well, this group, uh, they're, they're mostly Cleveland Orchestra members and, and a lot of uh, um, great members. I mean, the orchestras, everybody in there is great, but we've got uh, a group that has the, the first principal flute, first principal oboe, associate concert master on violin, um, assistant principal on cello, uh, great, great person from the viola section. And um, and then a friend of theirs on piano, um, we've had them in. We probably have them in about three times a year, just because their schedule's so packed, heading to Miami and Vienna and all the places the orchestra goes. And the the first time we had them in, the, the doors were packed. I mean, we had a line out the street, and we're talking a bar that seats about two hundred. Um, just full to the gills, all there to see classical music and drink beer and eat hot dogs. 
Sean, how did you strike up that relationship, and what did the musicians think about performing in basically a bar restaurant? Well, um, I met the uh, principal flute player at a at a gathering, a, a Gordon Square awareness raiser uh, over on the east side. And we got to talking, and he said, you know, I always wanted to play in a bar. You know, I've been the principal flute at the orchestra for 20 years now. I've played in all these great concert halls, but I, I always wanted to play in a bar. And I said, let's do it. Um, took us a while to get the group together and get the first concert set up. And I think for a few of the people in there, it was a real change for them. They're used to being perfect when they play and expected to be perfect. And on our stage, they're not expected to be perfect. It's much more like a rock concert. Yeah, do they think they can, you know, a little more showmanship, so to speak, a little more Jethro Tull-like on flute? Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) Um, What's really incredible, and I'm not a big classical music guy. I mean, I'm just really kind of getting into this, uh, having these, these folks in. When you see them on that stage up close like that, and they don't have a conductor that's telling them how to do what they're doing, they're really playing off of each other. And you can see the way they're looking at each other on the stage and picking up on each other's cues, and it's exciting. I mean, I never in my life would have thought I'd say live chamber music is exciting. (laughs) But when they do it, and the crowd's fired up, and they don't have to sit there and be quiet the whole time. People get into it, and it's fun. Now, what you have coming up is a special, I guess, two-night recording. Tell me about that, and also why you chose vinyl as the sort of (laughs) one of the ways of putting it out there. Yeah. Well, you know, each time we did this, part of the fun is this uh, risk element, really. The first time we did it, uh, we never... We didn't know what it would work in a bar. Once we knew it would work, we've tried pushing it each time a little further. So this time we wanted to, to try recording it and sharing what happens in the Happy Dog with a broader audience. Uh, let people know how exciting live classical music can be. And so we pulled together a great team. You know, there's some there's some folks who used to work for Telark Records when that was still around here in Cleveland. Grammy winning engineers and Grammy nominated producers and they got on board with this idea of recording in a bar. I think some of them had done some of the Blue Note jazz live recordings in the past and so the thought of kind of taking that concept of recording jazz in a club and and applying it to classical was exciting for them. So we you know we tried it out. We had a concert back in August that we did uh, over the radio. Um, worked out some of the kinks, but uh, we'll be flying by the seat of our pants a bit. The shows are going to be next week, Tuesday, December 4th, and Wednesday, December 5th. They start at 8 p.m. They'll probably run to about 10.30. And uh, admissions free. We'll be pre-selling Pre-selling the record, we've got uh, concert posters for sale. Uh, we're trying to raise the funds to uh, to pay for the recording. Uh, we've actually got a Kickstarter campaign uh, out there on the internet. If you go to happydogrecords.com, you can see our Kickstarter video and and get all sorts of other information about the project. But um, but we did. We made the decision to put it out on vinyl because. Vinyl is making a big comeback. Uh, you know, it seems like it went away completely over the last 10 years, and, and in a lot of ways it did. But um, especially for the newer rock bands, a lot of them are putting stuff out on vinyl, and it's, it's interesting, the reasons. Um, some of it's sort of nostalgia and kitsch, but really we got to learn more when we started working with a company in Cleveland that produces vinyl. It's one of the biggest vinyl producers in the country, uh, and it's located right on East 36th and Superior. It's a company called Gotta Groove Records. And they, they're, they're, they're killing it. They've got two shifts 
going now. They're making 15,000 records a week. They're shipping them all over the world. They're they're making records for bands in Australia and Germany, and they're exporting their records to China. And when you talk to when you talk to the folks that got a groove, they point out when you sit down and you listen to vinyl, it's a different experience than when you click on your iPod. You can't hit shuffle on a record. Well, I used to stack. I used to stack those forty fives and try to do that a little bit. But you're right. You, you can't. You can hit repeat. Repeat, I guess. And uh, but you, mm-hmm. it's one of those interactive ones where you actually have to take responsibility for sort of what's playing. And when it ends, you got to turn it over or turn it off. I guess. It's, yeah, and and you kind of have to sit there and listen to it, which a lot of times you know you can put music on and do other things, but but the experience of taking the record out of the sleeve putting it on the turntable and then you've got the album cover which which is kind of a lost art when we went to cds you had so little space to put the liner notes and and pictures and and whatever artwork you wanted to put on there you go back to to vinyl with the big 12 inch uh album cover and you can put a lot more interesting stuff there and really make the listening and experience we're talking today with Sean Watterson, co-owner of Happy Dog in the, in the uh, Gordon Square Arts District. They're going to have the Cleveland Orchestra, uh, Chamber Orchestra come in, record some of what they do. Now, you talk about the artwork, and I've seen the poster for this. Who designed that? It's called Ensemble oh, HD, and it has like this pile of some classical instruments. I'm not sure if it's mixed in with uh, other hot dog food items on that. I'm not quite sure how that is, but it's. Uh, it's yeah, a, I, love yeah the, I love the look at that. Who designed that? It's, uh, his name's J- Jake Grace. He um, he's one of our barbacks, and he's an artist. And at some point, we said, "Jake, why don't you draw us a couple of concert posters?" Um, very modest guy, and he does this really interesting stuff, um, different styles for for the different bands. And so when we asked him to do something with classical, he said, "Well, tell me something about it." And we said, "Well, here are the instruments. Is that the happy dog?" Um, it's kind of a mashup of the high culture and the low culture. And so we came up with this really cool picture of a sort of a pyramid of hot dogs with the, with the classical, classical instruments sort of tucked in. And that's, that's one of the, one of the premiums on the Kickstarter campaign, but it's a really cool poster. You know, um, Jake's going to be doing, he's doing all of our poster artwork for all of the other indie rock bands that are coming through and I think he's someone who's going to be around for a while and and it'll be sort of collectible sorts of posters not just not just the ensemble HD one but uh, a lot of Jake's work now I understand also you will be having this available on CD for those people who have thrown away or discarded from their uh, turntables or unable to play a, a vinyl record is that right we will be producing CDs, but, but also with the vinyl, um, we include a digital download code. So you can have the record, but you can also have it on your computer. Okay, now you just kind of combine the future and the, the past. by A digital yeah. download with my vinyl record that I've got to get sure. on it, too. Mm-hmm. That sounds great. And uh, just as a side note, Craig and I had a turntable installed in our studio here about two months ago. We're we ready. Found, we found it in a cabinet somewhere in an engineer uh, we asked him if he could put it back on because we still had some records hanging around here. So occasionally, we will break out the vinyl. We've we've well, we've rediscovered some of the reasons why we hated vinyl, but other than that, <laughs> you know the skipping or the the skating that's happening with the needle arm. But other than that, it's it's been a fun adventure, and I'm sure that uh, you'll encourage a lot of maybe those happy dog eaters to find their old uh, turntables once this experience takes place. Yeah, and I'll, we'll be sure to bring you a copy of the album. Or- we're looking at a May 2013 record release date, and and we picked that date because somehow we convinced the entire Cleveland Orchestra to spend two weeks in the Gordon Square neighborhood next May. And so in the middle of that uh, really neighborhood residency that the orchestra is going to be doing uh, on the west side of Cleveland, we're going to we're going to have a big record release party. Have ensemble perform then, and uh, really make a big celebration of it. 
Now, in the past, uh, Cleveland Orchestra recordings have won Grammy Awards. Is there any mm-hmm. any any sights on that at all? Is that even a possibility in some way? I think it is. I think it is because there is a big national movement to bring classical music out of the severance halls and the big music museums and get it reconnecting to new audiences. And and what we're doing um, has been picked up. Uh, NPR and, and the New York Times and Philadelphia Inquirer have all written stories about this group playing at the Happy Dog. And it's because it's generating this excitement about classical music. So we, we're going to be pushing for it. We're, we're going to be bringing the national press through next May when we've got the Cleveland Orchestra playing at St. Coleman's Church and in 78th Street Studios during their big third Friday event. Um, we're really going to make it a big news event because in the classical world, the news is Cleveland's a place where this innovation around classical music reaching new audiences is happening. And it's because we've got the level of quality that we have in a city as accessible as a, as a city like Cleveland. Our guest today has been Sean Watterson, co-owner of Happy Dog in the Gordon Square Arts District. That's uh, that's out Detroit and what is it? Uh, West? West 58th in Detroit, 5801 Detroit. And if people want to find out more about this event or your place of business, what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, to find out about this event, uh, please go to happydogrecords.com. And to find out more about the Happy Dog, um, you can find us on Facebook. We post all our events up there. Uh, and it's just uh, just go on Facebook and look for the Happy Dog. Now, let me see. I look at this menu, and it has like a circle. It's like a fill-in-the-blank. I don't know if I need a number two pencil to make this work. But I would go in, and I would basically fill out what toppings I want on my hot dog and turn it in, and that's how it comes to my table? Yeah, it's like being back in school. you got to make sure you fill the circle in all the way. <laughs> no X's. We need we have some computerized. <laughs> no check marks. <laughs> well, Sean, thanks for sharing the stories with us, and hopefully uh, good success and lots of uh, success and a good turnout coming up. Thanks a lot, Bruce and Craig. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about it.